Great. Well, welcome everybody to our California Ballot Initiatives Pros and Cons meeting. Um, before we begin, I just want to point out to everyone that the meeting is being recorded so that others can watch it after we're finished here. If you do not wish to be identified, please turn off your video and change your Zoom screen name. Um, since we're also in this large, larger group, please be sure that your microphone is muted so that we don't pick up background noise from your um, area and, and dogs barking and so forth. Thank you very much. We'll take questions via the chat function. So write in the chat if you come up with questions during the meeting. Let me introduce myself. I am Chris Ritter and I am the current president of our Danville Alamo Walnut Creek chapter of the American Association of University Women. And if you can't find me in the gallery of faces that you're looking at, please click your uh, Zoom application to speaker view. And that'll probably be the best way to participate in this seminar because then the person who's talking will show up and you'll be able to find them in all the different wonderful people that we see attending this event. Um, this evening's program is co-sponsored by the American uh, Association of University Women and the League of Women Voters of uh, Diablo Valley. I want to tell you just a little bit about the American Association of University Women because we do have lots of non-members with us tonight. Our group was founded in 1881, which is almost 140 years ago, by a small group of female college graduates. And their idea was to work together to improve women's career opportunities and to encourage more women to pursue higher education. Well, things grew and grew, and today the AAUW has a nationwide network of 170,000 members and supporters. There are 1,000 local branches and 800 college and university partnerships. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and our mission is to advance equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. Our local Danville Alamo Walnut Creek chapter sponsors numerous educational programs such as this, as well as we also fund scholarships for local women. We fund science camps for eighth grade local girls and also a variety of advocacy efforts to advance gender equity. So please contact if you're interested in joining our lively group. So this evening, we're, this important discussion of our upcoming ballot measures will be led by our partners at the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. We have with us the honor to welcome two of the League's pros and cons designated speakers, Betty Felton and Carol Woods. So please join me in welcoming them to lead tonight's discussion. Betty and Carol. Thank you, I'll start, uh, Chris, appreciate it. And we'll start with our slide there. Great, terrific. Um, uh, we'd like to thank you for inviting the League of Women Voters to make this presentation. Uh, for the 12 state ballot measures. As, Car as Chris mentioned, I'm Betty Felton, a member of AAUW and the League of Women Voters, and my partner here today and friend is Carol Woods. As many of you may already know, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920, the year when women first gained the right to vote. Its purpose was, and still is today, to promote an active and informed citizenry for women and men of all ages. The League has two separate and distinct roles. The first one is education and voter services, much like we are doing tonight. And second is action or advocacy, as exemplified by the pros and cons positions and consensus that the local and state groups come to. We never support or oppose any political party or candidates. We do take position on issues, however, but only after we study uh, those issues at the state and local level and come to a consensus. We're here today to describe each proposition and their pros and cons so that you can make informed decisions on how to vote. We'd also, of course, like to invite you to become members of the League of Women Voters. You'll see their website um, at the end of this presentation on a resource slide. And now Carol will tell you a little bit about tonight. 
Well, uh, we're going to be reading from scripts. Uh, you should know that. And there are 12 ballot measures. The format, and you'll hear it repeated over and over, is first the title of the proposition, the items that the proposition would change, some background information, the fiscal impact, and then the pros and the cons. We're not going to list all the donations and all of the supporters or opponents because those are on voters edge and they're lengthy and they're updated frequently and you should check that uh, with voters edge and map light. I'm gonna do the even numbered propositions and Betty would do the odd numbered. And as you'll realize several of these measures are being revisited from past things we voted on. The time is shortened and we're going to focus in on the essentials. But sometimes the devil is in the details. So I would encourage you to go to Voters Edge and we don't want to get lost in statistics and things like that, but do check out those minor things um, and other for sources. The we'll do um, six of the measures and then we'll take a short break because I know your ears get tired. And now Betty's going to talk a little bit about how to ask a question. Thank you. Chris, could I have the next slide and then, um, great. So this is our plan as Carol has mentioned. And um, before we begin, we wanted to um, sort of remind you that we sent along uh, for those who registered, um, two documents, the pros and cons from the League of Women Voters, and as well as the easy voting guide that has much of the same information, but is put out with the supporters, the financial information, etc. The key, the key resource for you all um, is the website that's above my head in my, in my virtual background. And that is an organization and a website called Voters Edge. Voters Edge is your best resource and for many reasons. It not only has all the candidates and you can compare them, but it has all the ballot measures and all the pros and cons. Plus it tells you who are the supporters and how much money has been spent on either side of these ballot measures. So I really encourage you to look at Voters Edge especially because tonight we're, we'll be in a rush and we probably won't be able to mention all of the supporters and the, and the fiscal effects. Um, but those are all there in the Voters Edge description. And by the way, on Voters Edge, you can also mark your ballot, print it up at the end, and then use it as you fill out your actual ballot. So it's a great resource. Carol mentioned that I'd say something about questions. We'll hope to, to move through this quickly so that you can have time for questions. But the only way that the League and um, others where we've been doing this have asked us to do it is for you to put your questions in the chat box. You need to ask the question and give us the ballot measure number. So if you have a question about dialysis, ask about and put the number 23, ask your question. And then uh, Deborah and Joanne will uh, look at the questions. And if there is time, we will answer selected questions. Uh, thank you. And we look forward to um, hopefully enlightening you as we have ourselves in learning all this stuff. So we're glad you're with us. And Carol is going to start with Proposition 14. OK, we're off to the racehorses. Proposition 14 is on the ballot with the following wording authorizes bonds to continue funding stem cell and other medical research. Proposition 14 asks the state to issue the sale of $5.5 billion in state general obligation bonds over 11 years to fund grants from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, CIRM, for educational, nonprofit, and private entities for the purposes of stem cell and other medical research, therapy development, therapy delivery, medical training, and construction of research facilities. Some details of Proposition 14. 
are that 27% of the funds would be dedicated to research and therapy for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, epilepsy, and other brain and central nervous system diseases and conditions. The proposition would also make changes to the CIRM and its governing board with the intention of improving public oversight and including a 7.5% limit on the funds for administrative costs. Some background. In 2001, then President Bush issued an executive order prohibiting the use of federal dollars to fund cell research except for 21 existing embryonic stem cell lines. In 2004, California voters passed Proposition 71, a $3 billion bond measure that created CIRM. In 2009, President Obama reversed President Bush's order. Also during those years, induced adult non-embryonic stem cells have largely eliminated the need for embryonic stem cells. Now in 2020, the institution has spent or earmarked 90% of that initial bond money, and they're asking the state for more money to continue the institution and their research. The fiscal impact is not entirely known. There could be indirect fiscal effects for some healthcare programs such as Medi-Cal. The bonds would cost about 7.8 billion over a 30 year period. 5.5 billion for the principal and 2.3 billion in interest to repay the bondholders. The state's general fund would pay most of the costs with a relatively small amount of interest repaid by bond proceeds. However, the state would also be entitled to revenue from new inventions resulting from treatment or research funded by the CIRM. Proposition 71 revenues from the state have amounted to $350,000. Those arguing in favor of Proposition 14 say that thanks to CIRM, California is a global leader in the field of regenerative medicine and their work has led to significant advances in treatments and cures for many diseases. And with countless treatments and cures in the development pipeline, continued funding is necessary to continue the vital research. Funding from federal sources is unpredictable and unreliable. Proposition 14 also holds promise for continuing work in restoring healthy and quality of life for those suffering from chronic disease and injury. It will also help more Californians get access to affordable medical treatments by increasing the offering of clinical trials in the state. Those arguing against Proposition 14 say that long-term sustained funding was never the intent when California voters passed Proposition 71 in 2004. Private investors and groups, as well as the federal government, have made great strides in stem cell research and cures, so it's unnecessary for California to continue its funding using tax dollars. NIH provides $1.5 billion a year in grants to fund the same type of research. Analysts and news outlets have also questioned the management, integrity, and transparency of CIRM, pointing out that not only has CIRM been unaccountable to the legislature, but some of their executive salaries are considerably higher than equivalent positions. And the League takes no position on Proposition 14. Betty, number 16. 15. 15. <laughs> Next slide, please, Chris. So Proposition 15, this is the, oops, I'd like to have you do 15, please. Proposition 15 um, is, the, is the big one. This is probably has the most uh, 
it probably has the most attention and the most um, excitement about both the pros and the cons. The situation is this, taxes based on the value of commercial and industrial property are a major source of funding for county cities, schools, and special districts. Each year, a property owner pays a tax equal to the property's assessed value times the applicable tax rate. Proposition 13 limits property tax valuation and rates. And that was, I believe, 1978. Proposition 13 at that time capped the tax rate at 1% of the assessed value plus smaller voter approved rates to finance local infrastructure. A property's market value is the value at which it could be sold today. A property is reassessed to market value when it is purchased or when ownership changes hands. After that, the assessed value still can be increased by no more than 2% per year. Because the value of property, property has typically increased much faster than 2% per year, the assessed value of most property in the state is less than its market value. This is particularly true of commercial and industrial property, which changes ownership less often than residential property. Each county's property tax receipts from the 1% tax are distributed to local governments and schools using a formula that has been in place for many years. If passed, Proposition 15 would generally require commercial property be reassessed to market value on a periodic basis. There would be no changes in the rules for reassessment of residential, both owner occupied and a rental and farm property. If all of the property owned by a business has a fair market value of $3 million or less, that property would continue to be assessed based on the purchase price as adjusted. This means that properties at $3 million and less would not be reassessed reassessment of commercial property would be phased in starting with the tax year 2022 or at 2023. Under Proposition 15, a small business would not pay any tax on personal property. A small business is defined as one having fewer than 50 employees. Other businesses would not pay taxes on the first $500,000 of their personal property. Reassessment of commercial and industrial property to market value would increase the property taxes collected in each county. After paying for the cost of administering this measure and reimbursing the state for any loss of income tax, period. Um, the I'm sorry, after that, the balance of the additional revenue would be used to fund local governments and schools. The money for local governments, about 60% of the total, would be distributed according to the existing formula. The money for schools, about 40% of the total, would be deposited into a state fund and allocated among school districts generally using the same per pupil funding formula the state currently uses. <coughs> Excuse me. This allocation would provide money over and above the current constitutional minimum funding requirement. The estimated fiscal impacts from Proposition 15 on state and local governments would be an increase in annual property tax revenues of $7.5 to $12 billion in most years, $7 to $12 million in most years. Billion. Sorry? Billion. Did I say million? It's uh -huh. billion. <laughs> With approximately 40% going to schools and 60% going to local government. Arguments in favor of Proposition 15 are that the passage of this proposition would be an opportunity to restore 
seven to twelve billion dollars a year to our schools and to vital community services without raising taxes on homeowners renters agriculture or small businesses nearly 50 percent of the revenue raised by the measure will come from properties that have not been reassessed since before 2000. That includes properties owned by Disney, Chevron, Intel, IBM, who own land where assessments are still based on the 1975 values. Proponents feel that by closing the loophole used by large corporations, it will level the playing field for smaller companies. which make up, of course, 90% of commercial properties. Also, COVID-19 has hit specifically and especially hard the smaller local businesses, many of which are minority and women-owned. So some feel this group will be helped by this measure. Supporters also argue that the increased revenue will be indispensable for California city services and schools because of the staggering deficit resulting from the effects of the coronavirus. It's thought that Proposition 15 would also prompt development of vacant urban land by increasing tax, taxes on speculators who hold on to empty properties because their tax bases are low. Finally, there will be a phase in period of new property taxes on commercial properties. So proponents say that the changes won't occur all at once. Those arguing against Proposition 15 say that the legislature should look for ways to close loopholes, such as this corporate loophole that we discussed, rather than asking voters to approve a massive change to a popular proper property tax law during the chaos of a pandemic. They say that this ballot initiative does not include taxpayer protections, cost controls, accountability measures, or transparency requirements. Because there isn't a cap on administrative expenses, they argue that the new tax money could be wasted on administration. Opponents say that Proposition 15 does not address the real problem of inequity in property taxes. They say it's not the disparity between residential and other types of property. It's the disparity between taxes paid by longtime property owners and those who purchased recently. They argue that it is an inequity found for both residential and commercial properties. Opponents also feel that the protections for small business aren't strong enough because many of them are renters and the higher property taxes on buildings will just be passed on to them, greatly affecting their operating expenses. Another argument is that while Proposition 15 exempts agricultural land, it does not exclude fixtures and improvement, such as irrigation systems, barns, etc. Actually, the legislative analysis says that the measure does reduce the value of business equipment uh, by $500,000 or at those at less than 500,000 in those expenses paying no tax at all. I think I will stop there and um, there's lots more in voters edge, uh, but I think that's really um, all that you need to know so far about this. The, those for and those against. So we'll move on to Proposition 16. Carol? Proposition 16 is on the ballot with the following wordy, wording. Allows diversity as a factor in public employment, education, and contracting decisions. Proposition 16 is a constitutional amendment that would repeal Proposition 209 from the California Constitution. It would allow public school and agencies to take race and other immutable characteristics into account when making admission, hiring, or contracting decisions. It would not, however, alter other state and federal laws guaranteeing equal protection and prohibiting unlawful discrimination. Some background information is that in 1996, Proposition 209 was passed, banning the use of affirmative action involving race-based or sex-based preferences. It stated that discrimination and preferential treatment were prohibited in public employment, public education, and public contracting because of a person's or group's 
race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. After Proposition 209 was passed, one of the results was an immediate drop in Black and Latino enrollment at the state's elite public universities. As a consequence, some civil rights organizations have been trying to repeal Proposition 209 since it was passed. Each of their attempts, however, have been stymied in the legislature by a coalition of Republicans, moderate Democrats, and some aggressive legislators who represent districts with large Asian American voting populations. There are no direct fiscal impacts from Proposition 16. Those in favor of Proposition 16 say that Proposition 209 in 1996 was sold to voters as a way to restore fairness and reward meritocracy. Yet it did not eliminate preferences in college admissions based on alumni parents, geographic balance, or proficiency in sports. With regard to public employment and public contracting, they point out that while skewing the odds against women and minorities, it failed to prevent cities and counties from giving bidding preferences to local businesses or preventing officials from drawing up requests for proposals that give advantage to their buddies or campaign contributors. Proposition 209 went too far by prohibiting any consideration of diversity. This proposition does not mandate affirmative action nor establish quotas. It does allow for the consideration of a myriad of factors, including race, gender, ethnicity, and North national origin to allow equal opportunity in public education, employment, and public contracting. They further say that continuing the current race neutral business as usual stance means the problem will continue to be ignored. Those arguing against Proposition 16 say that the repeal of Proposition 209 would mean a return to race-based economic and school admission policies. And using race as a classification demeans the dignity and worth of people by judging them based on ancestry instead of merit and essential qualities. And specifically with regard to university admissions, the argument is is that if more spaces are made for the underrepresented, the Black and Latino Americans, then they must come from the overrepresented, the Asian Americans. The inevitable result would be yet more racism by the hurting of one minority group to benefit another. They argue further that the real answer to racial discrimination is not more discrimination, which this bill proposes, they say rather it lies in strengthening our institutions so that all students have access to a quality education and by giving opportunities to those who are economically disadvantaged. And lastly, the League urges a yes vote. Number 17. Thank you. Say, so, Betty, before we go on, Betty, did you tell what the League was going to recommend for Proposition 15? Yes, thank you, Chris. I did see that in the chat. Yes, both the League of Women Voters and AAUW have, um, re they recommend supporting, saying yes on Proposition 15. Okay, thank you. Proposition 17 is on the ballot with the following wording. It restores right to vote after completion of prison term. Proposition 17 is a constitutional amendment that would allow people on parole for felony convictions to vote in California. It would not change the law prohibiting people in prison from voting. As background information, you might want to know that the voting rights vary by state. And as of 2020, 19 states allow convicted felons on parole, a parole to vote. In 1974, California voters approved Proposition 10, which amended the California Constitution, restoring the right of felony convicts to vote, but only after completion of their imprisonment and their parole sentences. 
This is the current situation, and there are nearly 50,000 Californians currently on parole who cannot legally cast a ballot. The fiscal impacts of Proposition 17 are that it would increase annual county costs, likely in the hundred thousands of dollars statewide for voter registration and ballot materials due to the potential increase in voters. However, actual costs will depend on the number of people on parole who choose to register to vote. There would also be increased one-time state costs, likely in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to update voter registration, cards, systems, etc. Those arguing in favor of Proposition 17 say that once people complete their prison sentences, they should be encouraged to re-enter society and have a stake in their community. They opine that if California is serious about reintegrating the formerly incarcerated into society, they should restore their right to vote. California spends billions of dollars on the prison system with the intention and the promise of rehabilitating people. Yet when released, they're still treated like criminals, they argue. They pose that Californians must ask themselves, do they truly believe in rehabilitation? The nearly 50,000 Californians who have completed their prison sentences and are on parole pay taxes at local, state, and federal levels, yet are prohibited from voting at any level of government. They are neighbors, family members, and colleagues, and should have the opportunity to fully participate in society. Those opposing Proposition 17 say that among the parolees who would be allowed to vote are those who have committed serious crimes such as murder, voluntary manslaughter, and rape. They argue that those who cannot commit such crimes and need, they need to earn the right to vote again by completing their parole to the fullest extent. Um, a criminal's completed parole period allows for adjustment and, and re-entry back into society, they say. And they further argue that an individual still on parole has not yet really regained the trust of society which is an important agreement, uh, ingredient for participating in that society. Opponents refer to this proposition as a criminal injustice because former criminals would not be made to fully account for their behavior, saying that losing their right to vote is part of their punishment. The uh, League of Women Voters suggests a support vote or a yes vote on Proposition 17 and AAUW does the same. Yes from the league and yes from AAUW. Proposition 18. The wording is amends California constitution to permit 17 year olds to vote in primary and special elections if they will turn 18 by the next general election and be otherwise eligible to vote. As background information, here are a few important points to consider. In even numbered years, California holds two statewide elections, the primary and the general election. In the primary election, voters decide which candidates will compete in the general election. In 1971, the 26th Amendment to the US Constitution was ratified, allowing 18 year olds to vote. And currently, 18 states, along with Washington, D.C., allow 17-year-olds who will be 18 by the time of the general election to vote in primary elections. The fiscal impacts of Proposition 18 would be increased costs for counties to send and process voting materials to eligible registered 17-year-olds, and there would likely be a one-time cost to the state to update existing voter registration systems. Those arguing in favor of Propositions 18 say that this proposition, allowing 17-year-olds who will be turning 18 before the next election, will mean that they will be able to participate in a full election cycle. Proponents say that these young people, whose birthdays fall between the primary and general election, are at a disadvantage to those who are admitted to permitted to vote in the primaries, because without full exposure to the election process, 
they're unable to give their most educated vote in the general election. Also, when 17 year olds can't vote in the primary, it discourages them from voting in the general election. Supporters of this proposition argue further that young people today have already shown their commitment to political engagement and have made their voices heard, have demonstrated themselves to be articulate and thoughtful citizens. And importantly, that 17 year olds right now will have to live with the consequences of the voting choices adults are currently making at the polls. Those arguing against Proposition 18 say that while there's no clear age of maturity, they consider 18 as a rational point to mark the entry into adulthood. When most teenagers complete high school and head out on their own to enter college, the job world, or the military, they argue that 17 year olds are still legal minors living at home and under the strong influence of their parents and teachers, and that this is not conducive to independent thought or voting without pressure from their superiors. And finally, they say that 17 year olds have little or no experience paying the taxes or balancing budgets that they will be asked to vote on. The League recommends a yes vote. Proposition 19, um, this is a legislative constitutional amendment and it um, changes certain property tax rules. A bit of background first on this very complicated <laughs> and probably unnecessary ballot measure. Four propositions were passed between the years of 1986 and 1996 that shaped California's property tax rules. There were a number of core changes to the tax laws. One was that a principal residence property could be passed on to spouses or children without a reset of the home's taxable value. And the first $1 million of other real property to a child was exempted. Another change was that homeowners over age 55 could move to another replacement home of equal or lesser value while still maintaining the same property tax evaluation, provided it was in the same county or in a county that participated in what is called the tax transfer program. And finally, that homeowners age 55 and over age 55 could pass on property to a grandchild when the parent is deceased without tax reassessment. Well, Proposition 19 would make a number of changes to those laws. It would increase property taxes on inherited homes worth more than $1 million starting in the year 2023. And the resulting tax increased tax revenues would go toward statewide fire suppression. Yes, statewide fire suppression. And it also reimburses counties for costs associated with the measure. Proposition 19 would also allow special groups of homeowners who are people over age 55, people who are disabled and people who have not been affected, who have been affected by a natural disaster to transfer a property's taxable value to a more expensive home anywhere in the state up to three times in a lifetime. It would allow once in a lifetime transfers of property taxes uh, values for victims of wildfires and national natural disasters. Also, it would eliminate the transfer of taxable values of inherited properties unless the properties are the heir's principal residence or it is a farm. Arguments in favor of Proposition 19 are that it would close a loophole by requiring inherited homes that are not used as principal residences to be reassessed at market value when transferred. It's thought that these reassessments would generate hundreds of millions of dollars in added revenue that could be used for fire protection and emergency response services. Supporters argue that the flexibility for seniors to take their property tax bill with them when they move from one California county to another, referred to as the portability issue, rightly protects people from enormous spikes in their property taxes. 
They also argue that Proposition 19 would incentivize longtime homeowners who may have felt like trapped empty nesters to move out of the houses that are too big for them, making their homes available to younger and newer families. And they point out that the positive, there are positive benefits for persons with permanent disabilities who would be able to move up to three times without penalty, regardless of age. Arguments against Proposition 19 are that the California Constitution has already been amended by voters three times to protect the ability of homeowners to pass their homes to heirs without changing the original tax assessments. They feel that the proposition is a special interest measure from the real estate industry that seeks to raise hundreds of millions of new tax revenues to appease another special interest, the firefighters union. They further point out that property tax privileges afforded homeowners over 55 are already in stark contrast to the high property taxes many younger families face when they are, want to buy a new home. Opponents also point out that reassessment of some inherited homes to market value will force families to sell their properties because they cannot afford the higher property taxes. And finally, opponents say that while more revenue for firefighters is a good idea, this is not the vehicle or the process for it. They argue the legislature should be the body to address this issue by allocating funds when needed. So this is another complex budgeting measure that is too complex for the ballot. It should have been resolved and settled in the legislature. The League of Women Voters opposes Proposition 19, as does AAUW. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. AAUW says no position, takes no position on this. Now that's six of the measures. Uh, do you want to take a short break? I have a timer. Let's do it. Okay. So a two minute stand up. Okay, Sounds good. stand up, turn around. <laughs> okay. Okie dokie, Carol, what do you think? We have two minutes and 22 seconds left. Do you want to take a question during the break? Well, we could just, if everybody's ready, we'll just go ahead. I think the question is actually about Prop 15, not Prop 25. And it's asking for the positions of AUW and League of Women Voters on we will, 15. Um, Deborah, we'll get to that. When we get to Proposition 25, we will. I think that's why she's saying repeat the positions on Prop I think she means 15 because we haven't, we haven't reached Prop 25. Correct. So uh, League of Women Voters supports Proposition 15 and also AAUW supports yes on Prop 15. 
May I mention that in the handouts for the meeting uh, on the Eventbrite site and also on our AAUW Danville Alamo Walnut Creek website, there's a handout that you can download that lists all the AAUW positions on these various uh, measures as well. It looks to me that uh, Brody is asking about 19 instead of 15. On 19, uh, the League of Women Voters opposes. AAUW has no position. They did not take a position on 19. Okay, ready for 20? Ready. Onward, onward. All right. Proposition 20 is on the ballot with the following wording. Restricts parole for nonviolent offenders and authorizes felony sentences for certain offenses currently treated only as misdemeanors. If passed, the proposition would roll back sentencing and parole reforms enacted by Propositions 47 in 2014 and Proposition 57 in 2016. It would change current law so that people who commit certain theft and fraud related crimes, such as repeated shoplifting, unful, unlawful use of credit card, could be charged with a felony rather than a misdemeanor. Those charged with a felony could receive longer jail terms. Proposition 20 would raise the number of violent crimes to 51, including domestic violence and sex trafficking of minors, so that prisoners accused of them would not be eligible for parole review. It would also require county probation departments to ask a judge to change the parole status if a felon violates parole terms for a third time. Finally, the proposition would require that law enforcement collect DNA samples from adults convicted of certain misdemeanors for which samples were previously not required. To give you background on this proposition, in 2014, Proposition 47 was passed in large part to reduce the state prison population as ordered in district court and upheld by the US Supreme Court. Proposition 47 changed some offenses from felonies to misdemeanors, such as minor drug possession and robbery up to $950. Proposition 57 was passed two years later in 2016. It allows early release for nonviolent offenders who are in jail with multiple offenses after they've completed their longest sentence. It also intended to extend restorative justice work by incentivizing good behavior. It abolished life without parole for juveniles and changed sentences for some nonviolent, non-serious crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. Both propositions reduced overcrowding in state prisons from 160,000 in 2009 to 105,000, and from $8 billion a year to $7.4 billion of the state budget. This November's Proposition 20 intends to roll back both Propositions 47 and 57. The budget impact on state and local governments if Proposition 20 passes would be increased correctional costs by increasing county jail and state prison populations and the level of community supervision. There would be increased court related costs due to court filings, parole revocation processing, and increased costs due to collecting and processing DNA. The legislative analyst estimates that the increase in state and local costs would likely be in the tens of millions of dollars annually. Those supporting 20 do so because it makes our system tougher on crime and makes Californians safer by keeping potentially dangerous people in prison longer. They feel it allows prosecutors, prosecutors to charge repeated 
or organized petty theft as a felony rather than a misdemeanor, which would deter acts as deterrent to thieves. It would help make sure that people who have been violent aren't eligible for early parole. And it requires people convicted of some misdemeanors to submit a DNA sample to a statewide agency, which is good information to have in our database. Those opposing Proposition 20 do so because they feel its passage would roll back humane and effective prison reforms made in recent years to reduce the prison population in California as mandated by the federal courts and the will of the voters. They say there's no evidence that Proposition 47 and 57 have made life less safe in California. And supporters who say this are just trying to square pe scare people into voting for Proposition 20. As it stands, there's a greater chance of parole if there's been good behavior. This is part of a larger shift in California from sentencing to rehabilitation. Finally, locking up more people for longer is a waste of human lives and public resources. Lee recommends a no vote. Betty? Proposition 21, again, an initiative. The question, I, I like the pros and cons of the league, and I'm going to read those uh, rather than uh, the script that were used in videos. Proposition 21 expands local government's authority to enact rent control on residential property. So here we're talking about residential property versus uh, 15, which talked about commercial and industrial property. The question here is, should current state law be changed to allow cities and counties to apply rent control to housing that is 15 years old or older and limit rent increases to 15% once a new renter moves in. So it's a very prescribed uh, target in terms of this question. The situation is, we all know it, California renters typically pay 50% more for housing than renters in other states, sometimes more than twice as much. Rent is high here because housing demand greatly exceeds supply. About one-fifth of Californians are subject to so-called rent control laws, which limit how much their housing rent can be increased annually. Courts have ruled that such laws must allow landlords to receive a fair rate of return, meaning that landlords must be allows, allowed to realize some pro profit each year. Currently, a state law known as the Costa-Hawkins Rental Housing Act or Costa Hawkins, limits local rent control laws. They cannot apply to any single family homes. They can never apply to newly built housing completed since early 1995. And they cannot say how much rent can be charged to a new renter moving in. This proposal, Proposition 21, would reduce the limits on local rent control laws in Costa Hawkins so that cities and counties can apply rent control to more properties. Specifically, cities and counties would be able to apply rent control to all housing which is more than 15 years old, with the exception of single family homes owned by landlords who own one or two properties. Additionally, cities and counties would be able to limit how much a landlord can increase rents when a new renter moves in to increase rents by just up to 15% during the first three years after a new renter moves in. Prop 21 would require that rent control laws allow landlords a fair share of return. This would put past court rulings into the state law. The fiscal effects. These economic effects are, are interesting. If communities expand rent control laws, here are some likely effects. Some landlords would sell their rental housing to new owners who would live there. The value of rental housing would decline. 
some landlords would receive less rental income and some renters would move less often. The overall effects would depend on how much communities pass new laws, how many properties are covered, and how much rents are limited. Uh, there's state and local revenues and increased local government costs. They're described much better than I can read it to you, but I think I'll leave it right there. The League of Women Voters is neutral on this initiative. AAUW supports Proposition 21. Carol? Proposition 22 is on the ballot with the following wording. Changes employees classification rules for app-based transportation and delivery drivers. If you haven't seen these ads, you haven't been watching TV. If passed, this proposition would consider app-based transportation and delivery drivers to be independent contractors and not employees of a company as required by Assembly Bill 5. Among those drivers affected would be those who provide delivery services through a business's online app, such as Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash. As drivers, these independent contractors would not be entitled to state law employee protections, such as overtime pay, unemployment insurance, and workers' compensation. The proposition would require that instead, companies would provide certain benefits. They would be required to limit hours worked during a 24-hour period, establish a base wage of 100%, 120% of the minimum wage for the time spent driving, not waiting, pay medical costs and some lost income for on-the-job injuries, and give employees a health insurance stipend. It also has a, the proposal mandates safety training and sexual harassment policy and prohibits discrimination. Future amendments to this measure would require a positive vote of seven eighths of both the assembly and Senate or go back to voters. Here's some background. In September 2019, Assembly Bill 5 was passed, which designated app-based drivers as employees. Companies such as Uber and Lyft failed to reclassify their drivers. So California Attorney General Javier Becerra and the city attorneys of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego sued Uber and Lyft in May 2020 saying they were depriving drivers of the protections and benefits of employment and disobeying the law. On August 20th of this year, a California appeals court extended the length of time Uber and Lyft have to reclassify rideshare drivers as employees. As part of this appeals court ruling, the courts required the CEOs of Uber and Lyft to submit a sworn statement saying they would develop plans to comply with AB5 within a certain period of time if the appeals court upholds the case against them for not abiding by AB5 and if Proposition 22 fails to pass in November. The budget impact on state and local governments would be a minor increase in state income taxes paid by company drivers. Those supporting Proposition 22 do so because they feel prohibiting independent contract work for app-based drivers would eliminate thousands of jobs at the worst possible time. They feel that drivers should be able to decide when, where, and how much to work. And switching drivers to employees as AB5 mandates would cost employers millions of dollars which would result in higher prices for consumers. As a result, there may be fewer drivers, long, longer wait times, and a permanent shutdown of services in some areas. 
Finally, though this proposition would classify drivers as independent contractors, it would, however, raise wages and provide health care stipends for some workers. Those opposing Proposition 22 have conflict, conflicting various reasons. One, that technology has created a third type of employment beyond employee or independent contractor, and the state needs to address the unique needs of these workers and employers. This measure does not. Another group says that these are employees and deserve the standard protections of all employees. And this measure is trying to circumvent employer responsibilities. This measure was written um, by Uber, Lyft, and Dashdoor to benefit the companies, not the drivers. And yet another group says that this issue is too complex to be decided in an all or nothing, good and bad ballot proposition. There needs to be a legislative fix to AB5 and passing Proposition 22 will prohibit dealing with the problems by requiring a seven eighths vote of the legislature. The league does not have a position on Proposition 22. Which is the American Association of University Women. Okay. <laughs> okay, Proposition 23. Um, if your mind is not fuzzy yet, <laughs> this is another good one. Oh, yeah. Proposition 23 is an initiative that is worded on the ballot as authorizes state regulation of kidney dialysis clinics. It establishes minimum staffing and other requirements. Here's some information about this proposition. If passed, this proposition would require at least one licensed physician on site during treatment at kidney dialysis clinics. The California Department of Public Health can make an exception to this uh, when there is a shortage of physicians. I believe the uh, initiative says when there is no physician available as long as a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant is on site. The proposition would increase oversight by requiring reporting dialysis-related infections to a state agency and mandate state approval for clinics to close or reduce services. Clinics would also have to offer the same level of care to all patients, regardless of whether the treatment is paid for by private insurance or a government-funded program such as Medi-Cal or Medicare. To give you some background, about 80,000 Californians receive hemodialysis every month in 588 dialysis centers in California. This treatment, which you know cleanses the blood of waste products, is usually done three times a week, and each tra treatment lasts four hours. So a, a person on dialysis would normally spend up to 12 hours in one of these clinics a week. Newly, uh, nearly three quarters of these clinics are now owned by two for-profit corporations, Davita Incorporated and Fresenius Medical Care. The California Department of Public Health is responsible for licensing chronic dialysis clinics to operate in California using federal regulations as the basis for licensing. All chronic dialysis clinics must be licensed to receive Medicare and Medi-Cal payments. One of the current federal requirements is that a board certified medical doctor must be affiliated with each CDC chronic dialysis uh, clinic and be responsible for quality of care, staff training and clinic practices. Reports to the uh, National Healthcare Safety Network or kid on kidney-related infections are already a requirement for Medicare and Medi-Cal payments. I might also say that uh, you might know this, but uh, dialysis payments are separate from both the Affordable Care Act or um, in their special circumstances under, under private insurance. 
In February 2017, a coalition of nurses, technicians, patients, and union representatives backed a bill, SB 349, <coughs> introduced by Senator Ricardo Lara, that would establish minimum staffing ratios and require annual inspections of the state's dialysis clinics. Days before the bill was to have been signed, Lara decided to table it so there would be further discussion with stakeholders on the Hill's effects on the bill's effects on clients and clinics. At about the same time, the Service Employees International Union, the SEIU, began efforts to pass a 2018 proposition, Proposition H, 8, which would have put a 15% ceiling on the profits of private operators. The dialysis industry defeated that measure with a record $111 million campaign. This year's Proposition 23 has again been introduced by SEIU, who says, says that they are responding to stress from case overload and working conditions for the technicians. Opponents of the proposition say that there is no evidence that insufficient staffing has affected care. They say that data gathered by Medicare, which pays for most dialysis care, shows that California is doing better with lower infection rates and in states that have more defined staffing requirements in place than in states. If this proposition passes, the budget impact on state and local government is likely to be in the low tens of millions of dollars annually that the state would have to pay for Medi-Cal payments resulting from increased dialysis treatment costs and state monitoring of clinics. Those supporting Proposition 23 do so because they feel chronic dialysis clinics need to be better regulated. Also, having a doctor on site during patient treatment hours would assure more oversight. Finally, as it stands, the dialysis companies are making windfall profits when some of these profits should be spent on improving the oversight and the care. Those opposing 23 essentially the dialysis clinics and companies, do so because this provision would increase dialysis treatment costs by $320 million every year. And as a result, they feel that nearly half of the clinics in the state might become financially unsustainable. They also feel that asking that a doctor be on site is unnecessary for patient safety. There's no evidence that insufficient staffing has ever affected care. Nurses and other technicians are adequately trained to administer dialysis and respond to special needs. There is also concern that this might result in a doctor shortage in other necessary areas of care. The main um, supporters and opponents are listed in Voters Edge, but I should say for this particular, it's quite evident that the opponents are the two largest dialysis businesses. Davita and Fresenius. I encourage you to look at them on the stock market and see that they make billions of dollars in profits. The League of Women Voters is neutral on Proposition 23 and AAUW takes no position. Okay. Number 24 is called the Consumer Personal Information Law and Agency Initiative. If passed, this measure would expand the state's consumer data privacy laws. It would add new limits on how businesses can use sensitive personal information. In addition, it would prohibit businesses from retaining personal information for longer than reasonable triple maximum penalties for vi violations concerning consumers under age 16. It would also establish a California Privacy Protection Agency to reduce the burden on the California Department of Justice. This proposition is 52 pages long and has left consumer groups with years of privacy expertise divided. For example, some consumer groups would like to see an opt-in system rather than an opt-out system to prevent collection of personal information. 
and this proposition would not make that change. Also, in some instances, individuals who agree to have their data collected and or shared would pay lower prices for goods or services. Others would pay higher prices to protect their privacy. Others believe that this proposition better protects consumers' private data. Here's a bit of background. In 2018, California lawmakers passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, giving consumers the right to find out what data companies are collecting about them. It also gave consumers the right to opt out of having their data collected, as well as the ability to have their personal data scrubbed. It remains the only law of its kind in the country. Almost immediately, there were, are, efforts to water down this bill. San Francisco real estate developer Alastair McTaggart had been pushing for an even stricter ballot measure, but the state legislature stepped in, brokering a deal between McTaggart and the tech industry. This election's Proposition 24 was organized by McTaggart to get more consumer protection than the 2018 compromise afforded. The budget impact on state and local governments is an increased annual state cost for a new state agency that would enforce and implement consumer privacy laws and impose fines. There would be increased state costs from an additional workload for the Department of Justice and state courts. Some of this would be offset by penalty revenues. Those supporting Proposition 24 do so because they feel the recently passed California Consumer Privacy Act doesn't adequately protect individuals. For example, it doesn't require permission from a parent or guardian before collecting data from consumers younger than 13. And it allows sharing of a person's race and financial status. This new law would further prevent the sharing of an individual's private health information, as well as a person's location. Proponents feel it's important to establish a new state agency to share responsibility for oversight and enforcement with the California Department of Justice, because the Department of Justice is not equipped to deal with the growing problems having to do with data collection. Those opposing Proposition 24 do so because this is the wrong way to try to settle a complicated issue. In 2018, California lawmakers passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, which remains the strongest law of its kind in the country. This proposition doesn't give the 2018 bill a chance to see if it adequately protects consumers. The Department of Justice already has the power to enforce consumer data privacy laws. Changes could be made within the existing department to enforce laws. There's no need for a special new agency. Opponents also feel that because of some ambiguous working, wording in its 52 pages, if passed, this initiative could result in a string of lawsuits from private companies. And the League urges a no vote on Proposition 24. Okay, hey, last one. Okay, Proposition 25. This is the referendum on a law that replaced money bail with system based on public safety and flight risk. It is worded on the ballot as the referendum to overturn a 2018 law that replaced money bail with a system based on public safety risk. This proposition would uphold a law that replaces the California money bail system with a system based on public safety. In other words, Proposition 25 is asking voters if they agree with a law that was passed in 2018. If passed, Proposition 25 would uphold Senate Bill 10, which allows accused suspects to be released from jail before trial without bail based on whether an individual presents a risk to the public. 
Also, with the passage of Senate Bill 10, most suspects of misdemeanor offenses are cited and released within 12 hours. Detention is based on risk. In 2018, oh, let me give you a little background first. Criminal suspects currently pay a cash bond to be released from jail before trial with the promise that they would return to court for their trial. The cash bond is repaid to suspects after trial, regardless of the outcome. County superior courts can set cash bail amounts. Agents who offer these cash bail bonds usually charge 10% for their services. In 2018, a landmark new law, SB 10, required superior courts to replace this bail bond system with a pre-trial assessment division tasked with conducting risk assessments for conditions of release. This system completely replaces the cash bail system. In other words, a suspect determined not to be a risk is to be released without paying any bail. Almost immediately after the bill was passed, a signature gathering effort was initiated by Californians Against the Reckless Bail Scheme this group was able to temporarily stop implementation of the bill and to bring it to the voters now as Prop 25. If passed, Proposition 25 would uphold SB 10 and replace the bond system now that is now with a risk assessment system for conditions of release. The budget impact for the state and local governments to switch from cash bail to a pre-trial assessment division would mean an increase in cost to state and local governments in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars annually due to the cost of the assessments. At the same time, there would be a decrease in county jail costs, possibly in the high tens of millions of dollars annually because there would be fewer people in jail. And there would be an unknown impact on state and local tax revenues related to the possibility of people spending money on goods rather than paying bail prior to trial. Those supporting Proposition 25 say that California has the biggest bail market with the highest bail rates in the country. They should not be, this should not be a for-profit market. Proponents who contend that holding a person in jail who is not a risk and who may not be guilty of a crime is inhumane. They feel that the current cash bail system is unequal. Nonviolent offenders who cannot afford bail are required to sit in jail for weeks or months awaiting their court day, whereas violent wealthy offenders can walk free. Also, if a suspect appears to be a risk, he or she will not be released before their trial date. Finally, proponents claim our prisons are overcrowded, and this is one of the best ways to reduce such conditions. Those opposing 25 do so because they feel that the 2018 law, SB 10, is too soft on crime and follows and allows for flight risks prior to trial. Although there may be some guidelines, there are no proven criteria by which an assessment division is made and can determine whether someone is indeed a risk. So the system is taking a risk in letting a suspect go free until their trial date. A bail system promotes safety by giving defendants an incentive to appear in court or face further charges and financial penalties. So a vote yes preserves SB 10. The League of Women Voters support Proposition 25 as well as the AAUW that calls for a support recommendation. And that's, that's it. There's a long question about Prop 24. Do you want me to read it, Carol, or you, did you happen to read it in the chat? No, I haven't looked at the chat. Okay, so I can read it to you. Um, okay. If you want to take that quest a question, that's the only one out there so far. Okay, yeah, read it to me. Okay, so Please respond to the criticism of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has described Proposition 24 as a mixed bag of partial steps backwards and forwards. The EFF 
argues that Proposition 24 would allow some businesses to create pay for privacy provisions yeah. that would downgrade services to those who do not pay additional fees, and it would reduce current protections that allow consumers to demand businesses delete their data and eliminate CCPA's protection of biometric information, which uh, examples of those include fingerprints, facial images, voice recognition, and some fo phones store this biometric data. So that was her question, a long one, but. From what I understand, uh, this pay for privacy is part of this. Uh, it could easily come about. Um, the other, the other part of it is that uh, it doesn't cover that opt-in rather than the opting out. That was the big deal. I think why people are objecting to it. It's really a mixed bag. Uh, I think we all want more privacy, but um, it puts pe poor people at a disadvantage if they have to pay for it. There's one more question, uh, Deborah. Yes, the, um, from Asha, and I believe this is about Prop 25. The prison industrial complex, complex, does it get any dent in numbers with the bail bond bill? I don't know about the, uh, the prison industrial complex, but the question before from Heidi Joy, her, question, her question says, does the risk become assessed via predictive algorithms. And mm -hmm. I picked up on that because you're absolutely true. And in fact, that's what um, is sort of at the heart of this. People don't like the assessment. And because the assessment is a mixture of, um, of algorithms. Uh, so a person comes in to be assessed and they take into, into account a number of different uh, pieces of data. And I'm sure it includes race and of previous convictions and you know, the multivariate equation that risk assessment always is. And so there are some people like, um, remember Quentin Kopp? Quentin Kopp wrote an op-ed, um, I think in the Cron, about um, it being a step backward for criminal justice reform because he doesn't like that an algorithm is determining somebody's risk. So, you're right, Heidi. Uh, it does include uh, predictive algorithms that are used to determine the assessments. But it does come down to a judge accepting that. Correct. Correct. Thanks, Carol. Yeah. We had a suggestion from one of the members that we review the um, recommendations of the League of Women Voters and the AAUW one last time on each of the propositions. You could simply just read them out. Betty, do you have both the data, both those lists there? Um, I have them on my individual things, but why don't we go down as we presented them and Carol will um, state the recommendations of the League and then, um, I'll, and then we'll transfer back and forth like we did. Is that okay, Carol? Yeah, let me get my lead recommends. I have the whole list here. Uh, Proposition 15, uh, let's see. Proposition 14, no recommendation. Proposition 15, the League of Women Voters supports and AAUW supports. Yes, on 16 from the League. Proposition 17, the League of Women Voters supports and AAUW supports. Yeah, we're missing the AAUW supporting of the last of those on Carol's. So they didn't, um, they didn't uh, recommend on all of them. They, but they did on the ones you just mentioned. So 16. 16 is we recommend support. And then I mentioned 17, they said support. Yes, also supports. Mm -hmm. 18 is yes, support, and I don't know the AAUW. Recommend support. Okay. On Proposition 19, the League of Women Voters opposes. AAUW has no position. Okay. Uh, a no on 20 for the League. 
on 21, the League of Women Voters. And AAU has no, no position on 20 either. So AAU doesn't take positions on these issues unless they affect gender equity generally. Oh. Got it. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry I um, went ahead. Okay, now we're talking about 21. League of Women Voters is neutral. AAUW says support. Right. Proposition 22, no position from the League. And none from AAUW either. Okay. Proposition 23, League of Women Voters is neutral. And AAUW has no position. And a no on Proposition 24. And no position by AAUW on that okay. measure either. And Proposition 25, League of Women Voters supports, AAUW supports. Right. Does that help, uh, Isabel? I think that's what, it was Isabel that- uh, Yes, Isabel yes. asked for that. Yes, thank you very much. That did help, thank you. And there are handouts uh, for the AAUW propositions on the web. Yes, I had those. I just wanted to make sure we all got all of the League of Women. I, unfortunately, I had to come in late, so thank you very much. That helped, that was helpful. The, uh, on the State League website, lwvc.org, uh, is the ballot recommendations and the reasoning behind it. Yeah, Chris, could you move to the last slide, please? Yes. Uh-oh. There, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, that will helpfully, hopefully give you a number of different places that you can go. Uh, we mentioned Voters Edge, which we think is our go-to yeah. um, detail. Um, there are also videos of the kinds of things that we've just done, and we've put those up there for you. The, and you can uh, get to that through the lwvdv.org website, a direct link. You don't have to copy this. Yeah. And then uh, we also sent to you, and it's also available on, the web, on our website, the Voter Information Guide, the Easy Voter Information Guide, and uh, the Contra Costa Voter Guide. So, and I have a, a thing, because I, it was a really interesting experience for me to vote today um, because talking about some of these things that um, I had been reading about, but when you sit there at your ballot and say, well, yeah. it's still a good ex um, experience and a good exercise in, um, in really thinking these things through. So Carol, did you have anything more you wanted to say? I, or? Just, I want to recommend the, both of these, the county and the state voter guides as, as having lots of good information, drop off places, early voting. And, you know, they actually have the text of some of these. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay, well, thanks, Carol, and thanks to AUW. Really appreciate it, you guys. And um, come to our next program and uh, we have a chat on uh, what is it third thursdays chris third thursday for aauw members we have a wine chat and board update for some real excitement <laughs> <laughs> and uh, november we're going to be having a program on social media right um and yeah okay thanks everybody for attending and i hope everyone got as much out of this as i did it was so fascinating i i'm very much appreciative of league of women voters and bringing this information to all of us well we're appreciative of you too chris thank you very much for having us okay thanks so much everyone good night have a great evening everybody night good night and fill out those ballots yeah